the roots of yoga here from India and spandex, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whatever they're making yoga pants out of. <coughs> you know, it's interesting because with the yoga festival coming up, of course, this is something that gets talked about a lot. The word yoga literally means union. That's what the actual Sanskrit word means. The definition of the word is union. In most of the ways it's taught these days, you would think it were a union of our nose to our knee, or our palms to the ground, or you know, if I could just touch my toes. But that's not actually what the word meant. It's a union at the highest of the self to the divine. But along the way, a union of the body to the breath, my inner self to my outer self, body, mind, spirit, and ultimately, self to the divine. That's really what it's about. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna goes through a lot of, I don't want to say trouble, but a lot of um, time and energy and words. When you've got a 700 stanza piece, every word is very, very precious. Talking about the asana. And he talks about, but what he means is, the asana that you sit on. And how thick it should be, how firm it should be, what it should be made of, how high it should be, how low it should be. And at the end, he says something very <coughs> telling. Now that you have established yourself in asana, you are ready to begin the practice of yoga. Beyond that, there really isn't any possible question that the asan could be the yoga. I mean, he's made it so clear. Now that you're established in asan, whether we mean this asan or whether we mean chicken asan, you're ready to begin the practice of yoga, which means the asan is a crucial component we're not saying forget the asana. But it's only the beginning. It's not the end. And then you look at Patanjali, and Patanjali gives us eight limbs of yoga that begin with our yama niyama, which really could just be called the Ten Commandments of a Righteous Life. I mean, it has nothing to do with whether you're planning to practice Kundalini yoga, or Ashtanga yoga, or Bikram yoga, or just Gyan yoga, or Bhakti yoga. There are things like non-violence, truthfulness, non-stealing, non-hoarding, purity. This is this is what the foundation of our yoga is. Asana is limb number three. So if I were a contractor and I said, I'm going to build a house and we're going to start on the third floor, <laughs> you'd say, maybe you should go back to school. <laughs> because you can't build a house starting on the third floor. The minute the slightest storm comes, what happens? That house goes And so if we begin our yoga practice, only with us, and we don't have a foundation of the yamas and the niyamas, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about traditional yoga being practiced in India, or you're talking about hot yoga or acro yoga, I mean, it, doesn't, it really doesn't matter. If you're using the word yoga, there has to be that foundation. 
that which we do for our bodies is fabulous for our bodies. And if we turn around and we end up being violent, stealing, cheating people, well, our bodies are still going to benefit. But then it's called acrobatics, or it's called going to the gym, or it's called stretching exercises. It's not called yoga. And so, whether we're practicing it here or whether we're practicing it there, that foundation needs to be there. And this is, you know, when we talk about yoga off the mat, yoga off the mat doesn't just mean I volunteer Saturday afternoons at a charity. It means, I mean, it's wonderful, sure, spend your Saturday afternoons at charity. It's a much better place than the shopping mall. But that doesn't, that's not all that yoga off the mat means. It means that when I walk out of my class, how am I speaking? In the dressing room. God, did you notice? Looks like she's put on a whole bunch of <laughs> what, what's she thinking wearing clothes like that? Right? So violence right there in the dressing room. Like I'm not even out of the yoga studio. Violence to myself. Who the hell do you think you are wearing clothes like this? You've put on weight. You really need to cover yourself up more. God, you're so out of shape. You'll never make it. Look at all those other people in the class and how wonderful, gra wonderfully graceful they are. You're such a klutz. So we're violent to ourselves, to others. Then I walk out and I have a chicken sandwich for lunch. <laughs> so violence to the chicken, violence to the people who are starving in the world who could have been fed with the grain that was used to turn that chicken into my chicken sandwich, violence to the earth. And that's only one of the yamas. We've got 10 to work with. So, I mean, you could take them one by one by one and look at how are we living this and turn that into a yoga practice that's just as valuable and just as important as what we're doing on the mats. But then, of course, as I said, it doesn't end with asana because Patanjali takes us all the way up into samadhi. So if you're ending with asana also, then again, great for your body. But there's a lot juicier fruits on this tree of yoga if you just click, keep climbing. And it takes us up from asana, through pranayama, pratyahara, dharan, dhyan, meditation, samadhi. So we keep going. So in conclusion, in terms of yoga in the West and yoga here, I don't want to make assumptions and say, well, all of the yoga here includes all eight limbs. And the yoga abroad is just based on whether you've got the newest model of yoga clothes. <coughs> In both places, I think that you certainly will find people who are really engaged in a practice of the full yoga whose ultimate goal is the full union. And in both, both places, you're going to find, of course, people just selling acrobatics and weight loss. But what's important for us as practitioners is to realize that I've been brought onto the path of yoga for something more than just health in my body. Health in the body is great. As BKAS Iyengar always said, you know, it's really hard to sit for meditation long enough to attain samadhi when your back is killing you, or your hips are killing you, or your knees are killing you, or you're sick, you can't get out of bed. 
So the body's a temple, we take care of it. But we realize it's only one piece. And I want to just add in quick conclusion to that because there's a, a slight caveat that I, it's important to share. As I mentioned, BK has Iyengar's name. And the caveat that I want to share is that he personally, as a teacher, spoke about the ability to actually go from limb three straight through limb eight in the asana. And so in the Iyengar yoga classes, you tend not to find any emphasis at all on meditation or you know the, what we would call quote unquote higher spiritual practice. And yet what I can tell you from actually witnessing it with my own eyes is that watching BKS Iyengar come out <coughs> of difficult yoga asanas, which he managed to stay in for like three times, and this is when he was about 85, about three times as long as his top senior teachers who were a third of his age. When he came out, his eyes looked like the eyes of saints when they open their eyes for meditation. So he actually did achieve that. And I always feel like it's important to qualify that because we always distinguish them. And yes, asana, it's not enough, and we have to go higher. But there is that caveat that somehow if you're blessed in that particular way, your asana practice actually becomes all eight limbs. Now I can also tell you I've never seen anybody else do it. So it probably for, for most of us is important to bring in the other elements as separate practices. But he did and it was phenomenal to witness. <coughs> 